to all those of you who are joining us here at Brookings in our Falk Auditorium, and hello to those of you who are joining us virtually from around the world. I'm Suzanne Muller from Falk. Atrocities committed by the Russian army have sparked accusations of war crimes, and in March, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Russian President Vladimir Putin for unlawful deportation of Ukrainian children. Some voices are going further than this, saying that a genocide is being perpetrated by Russian forces, with Putin seeking to inflict terror and destroy any remnants of Ukrainian culture and society. This conflict may be the most significant challenge to the international legal order since World War II, and marks the return of war to the European continent, looking back to history and how the trauma of genocide and of two world wars has shaped the subsequent European and international order is crucial to prepare for our common future. I'm delighted to welcome our keynote speaker here today, who will offer her expertise on these issues, Professor Annette Becker. Professor Becker is a French war historian and expert in genocide studies and the two world wars. She's a professor of contemporary history at Paris West Nanterre La Défense. Her research focuses on the wars and genocides of the 20th and 21st centuries, their memories and their omissions. She also works on artists, writers, and intellectuals in the time of war and on history museums where violence and war crime narratives are depicted and sometimes instrumentalized by, instrumentalized by memorial tourism. Professor Becker is one of the founders of the Museum of the Great War in the north of France and of the historic route of the Memorial of the Shoah in Paris. She's an administrator of the National Museum des Invalides in Paris, and her latest books include 14 to 18, Understanding the Great War and Messengers of Disaster. Following Professor Becker's address, she will be joined by Omar Bartov, the Samuel Pissar Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Brown University, who will respond to her remarks. They will be joined by my colleague, Tara Varma, who is a visiting fellow in the Brookings Center on the United States and Europe for a brief moderated conversation. And many thanks to my team here in Foreign Policy and especially in the Center on the United States and Europe for the work that has brought this event to life. After the conversation among the panel, we'll open the floor to questions from the audience online and in the room. Microphones will be passed around the room here at Falk Auditorium for any questions from individuals here. And for those who are online, please submit your questions via email to events at brookings.edu. A final reminder that we're streaming live, and if you're using social media, you can share this event by using the hash hashtag Aron Lecture. I'd like to now offer the Deputy Chief of Mission, Aurélie Bonal, uh, an opportunity to come to the stage and to deliver some opening remarks. Hello. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Good afternoon, friends and, and colleagues. I am delighted to introduce this year's 18th Raymond Aron Lecture, organized and hosted by the Brookings Institution. As you know, uh, France and all of us at the embassy attach great importance to this annual event. This lecture offers a unique opportunity to exchange views on issues that are at the forefront of world affairs and to promote the sharing of ideas and French-American friendship. I would therefore like to warmly thank the Brookings Institution and all those who helped organize this discussion uh, with a special word of appreciation to Tara Varma who coordinated today's event. These lectures are more than a, a symbol of the friendship and an honor for the French speakers who've taken part in them 
Actually, two of them, uh, two of them um, are now government ministers, so say something about, uh, about the Brookings. Uh, as you said, Suzanne, we have a long-standing relationship with the Brookings, and uh, Tara is an embodiment of, of this relationship, and I'm thrilled uh, that, that this is continuing. Um, while Raymond Aron was a philosopher, sociologist, political scientist, and journalist, it is his work as a historian that we are focusing on today. And I would therefore like to give a special welcome to, uh, as, as you did, a uh, special welcome to our two speakers, uh, Dr. Annette Becker, distinguished professor at Paris West Nanterre La Défense and a senior member of the uh, Institut Universitaire de France, and to uh, Dr. Omer Bartov, who is a Samuel Pizer Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at uh, Studies at Brown University. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are really fortunate to have you here as you are both world-renowned academic authorities who have earned great admiration for your work on the world wars, genocide, and more broadly, the importance of uh, memory. I'll just say a few words on your respective careers, uh, but I, I, won't, uh, I won't develop because uh, uh, Suzanne, you already did it. Um, Professor Becker, actually, I, I learned that you once taught at the Lycée Français de New York, um, and you've been teaching at uh, the university level since the late 1980s. And you've been a visiting scholar at numerous uh, universities, uh, including Princeton and the Institute for Advanced Studies, Yale, Berkeley, and Rutgers. You have written extensively on the two world wars and the extreme violence they fueled, with an emphasis on military occupations and genocides. Your research also has focused on humanitarian politics, trauma and memory, particularly among intellectuals and artists, and your biography of uh, Guillaume Apollinaire uh, earned you the, uh, the Prix de la Biographie Littéraire from the Académie Française, and I really love Apollinaire, so I, uh, <laughs> I can, there's a connection there. Professor Bartov, you were a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows, a visiting scholar at Princeton University's David Center for Historical Studies, and the Raoul Wallenberg Professor at Human Rights at Rutgers Universities, University, sorry, before joining Brown University, where you have taught Holocaust and gen genocide studies since the, the, two, the year 2000, sorry. You are a leading expert on genocide and the political role of the Wehrmacht during World War II, and have authored more than 10 books. The most recent one, The Butterfly and the Axe, was published this year, and it is set in Ukraine and it addresses the vital need to learn the stories of those who were murdered during the Holocaust without leaving any documentary trace. Professor Becker, almost 16 months after Russia's illegal and horrific invasion of Ukraine, you will examine the connections between this new war in Europe and the two world wars. In other words, it is history and its inexorable influence on present day events that we are going to be discussing today. Every day, we all receive masses of information on the latest developments in Ukraine, images of war and destruction, testimonies from displaced civilians and accounts from soldiers who are fighting to defend their territory. It is very important to be aware of these realities and equally essential to put them into historical perspective. History not only helps us to understand a war's root causes, but to anticipate its various possible outcomes. I want to wrap up this brief introduction with a quote by Raymond Aron, which I think is quite appropriate to our conversation today. Ce sont les hommes qui écrivent l'histoire, mais ils ne savent pas l'histoire qu'ils écrivent. It is men who write history, but they are unaware of the history they are writing. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Professor Annette Becker. Thank you very much. Thanks so much to both of you for this very, very nice introduction. Thanks to the Brookings in general for the invitation. Thanks to Omer Bartov to have accepted to be my respondent. And thanks to Raymond Aron as a new as, new as a teenager. And to Fritz Stern, who was a great friend and who is very missing. It would be great to explain the situation. I begin also by a quote by Raymond Aron that you have here. The history of mankind 
tramples the corpses of cultures as well as those of men? Where is it going? The facts of tomorrow will be ever justifying the sufferings of those who fell in the way. Again, no one can answer. On March 15, 2022, three weeks after the Russian aggression of Ukraine, the great Ukrainian writer Andrei Kurkov wrote in his diary of an invasion about the strata of war. I quote him, all along my life, war has never been very far. His grandfather was killed by the Nazi near Kharkiv, buried in a mass grave. Quote, somewhere above his grave, Russian soldiers kill Ukrainians. It doesn't say Ukrainian soldiers, but Ukrainians. Civilians have been immediately targets in the invaded territory at the point, he said a few days later, all this begins to give the impression of a genocidal will. War, hate, cruelty, invasion, occupation, crime of aggression, crime against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, imperialism, reprisals, mass graves, ethnic cleansing, war culture, propaganda, fake news, bombardment, camouflage, trenches, front, fear, refugees, rape, denial. A semiotic of, of war has been back, which, should, which looks like a reenactment of the entire 20th and 21st centuries. From 1914 to 2014, one century since the beginning of the First World War to the war of occupation of Donbass in eastern Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea by Russians against the independent state at the border since 1991, Ukraine. What Timothy Snyder's has rightly called bloodlands has circled blood for much longer than the 30s and 40s he wrote about, and it goes on till this minute. So we have to replace this war in a long century. First World War, in 1917, civil war, and huge pogroms, 30s, Holodomor and Great Terror, Second World War and Holocaust, and 2014, and the special operation of 20. To 23. How the World War Wars and the genocides, which were part of them, show analogies with the present war and are used by the propaganda. In the same time, we should be aware that if the past finds its roots in very long trends of events and memories, this history is taking place today in the present time, and analogy should be, should be used to understand, not to give eternal truth. Mark Bloch, my personal hero, historian, combatant, assassinated by the Nazi as a resistant, wrote, we think always too late. Let's try not to, and ground the short time of this war 60 months, as you just said, in four days, in the long time of history, in the long time of living through bombings, missiles, ruins, drones, violence, torture, crimes, genocides, and now ecocide. We have to think about it in the long time of mutual history, take seriously the myth, the heroic figures, which are built and unbuilt, the truth and the lies which sustain not only the speeches, but the war strength. And this, because the Russians have put history at the heart of their war, a false history, full of omissions and distortion, but the heart of their aggression will. As 
the French historian Nicolas Vert put very well. He wrote a book called Putin, Historian in Chief. And the Belgian historian Anton Debat speaks about crimes, about history. You have it here. Putin saying, if history, if any guide. So he puts history in the middle. But everything he says later is not true. And the best proof now he says that there are, he has no plan to occupy the Ukrainian territory. And it, it is what has been done two days after, after this uh, speech. You can see it here in this very interesting painting by Vasily Neteransko, We Are Russians, God With Us, which is exhibited now in Moscow. He is a favorite painter of uh, Putin. And you can see the soldier in the middle. You can see the religion aspect. I, I'm not going to do too much about it. But you can see the soldier in the middle with a Z on his uh, uniform. Actually, the first light of uh, Putin in this way of seeing uh, history is to forget completely or nearly completely about the beginning of the century. It's like if his history was beginning somewhere in the uh, Second World War, during the Patriotic War. But there was something before, and it is what I will begin by saying, the First World War as a laboratory for a total war. I think that the philosopher, Lithuanian and French, Emmanuel Levenas, said it very well, you have it here. He, he spoke about the unrest which began in uh, 1914 and never stopped. Uh, he points out uh, that to understand well this century, we have to go back uh, to the past of the First World War and also to a world that really unites all this time, the world of total war. Facts and statistics are needed on an enormous scale to assess the war, but geography and statistics do not bleed. We have to understand the blood and the tears by looking at the face of war on both the military and the home front. President Zelensky, when he came to France, compared the horror of battle and the strength of Ukraine to the Battle of Verdun. It was very good propaganda, but also good history. He had good counselors. The German generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff coined in 1916 the term Battle of Material to describe the Battle of Verdun and the Somme. But their, their soldiers described it as devastation or butchery. The general and the soldier were right. And it is true till today at the moment I am speaking uh, to, to you. Battles at the time became a series of siege lines of trenches like this one were extending so far that it was very difficult to break the uh, enemy lines. The result was, like in this painting of Paul Nash that I like very much, Void of War, 1918. No men in the work of Nash. How many were killed or wounded? How many were made prisoners of war? How many were declared missing or used sometimes as human shield? All these words belong also to today. When you look at this photo, an Instagram account by a Ukrainian soldier or Bakhmut, uh, you wonder if it is First World War or Ukraine uh, today. A new front had just been added. In 1917, the Belgian 
use the water to stop the German invasion and did harm their own country in order to stop the invasion. This time, it is the uh, Russians uh, who uh, tried uh, to break the Ukrainian by uh, the uh, catastrophe of the dam or Karkhoka. Uh, just a little parenthesis, it was done exactly the same by the Russian and the Syrians in Euphrates in Syria. And uh, so the modus operandi is obviously exactly uh, the same. This is also what is going on now and then. The camouflage uh, tanks, uh, which is uh, now very important in uh, Ukraine. I particularly like uh, the one on the right because it's an old tank from the Second World War, which is Russian, which has been disabled by the Ukrainian. And they took it, the Germans took it to the Russian embassy in Berlin, and it is like menacing the uh, Russian. Uh, it is the war of propaganda going on, the camouflage uh, again. You have the false tank, which is used now in Ukraine, which is a... Uh, 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 inflatable and the false cannons of 1915. Uh, it's unbelievable how the two wars can coincide this way, uh, even with the uh, new ways of doing war. The same rules apply, uh, actually. And again, Nesterenko, uh, thanks to you, I've met this uh, painter, and uh, it's really fascinating to see how he paints today. This is a gas attack to, uh, to show how the Russians were uh, extremely courageous during the First World War. Uh, suddenly it arrives. And <clears throat> the, uh, the fact that it was on the uh, battlefield of Ukraine at the time uh, is not uh, by accident. But <clears throat> the, the rest of the battlefield is actually the battlefield for uh, for uh, civilian, the destructions which affect civilians are the first doing uh, a total war. And I put together, if I can, um, the destruction of Reims by a, a painter whose house itself was destroyed in front of Kherson underwater. The other figure of the war is obviously, the uh, refugees, the refugees which are actually the first figure of the war. And it's how we uh, find out all over the world that this war was coming because the refugees were already there. And uh, they are here in uh, welcoming, if we can say, in Venezia last year. And um, it was the same during the First World War and during all the wars, actually, which was uh, going on. The speciality of the First World War was occupation. For the first time in huge territory, there were occupation, and uh, you have, you see, uh, Otto Dix showing what happened to the civilians who were in their normal villages in 1917 uh, in their normal towns, and whose territory is now uh, occupied. And it is at the time that the, the idea of crime of war was already uh, coined. The last thing I want to say about the First World War we can think about is the extreme nationalism which was uh, at uh, stake. And there was, during the First World War, for the first turn on a huge basis like that, the internment of the enemy aliens. And uh, it's, till now, it's a big thing in, in Canada. I don't know see if some Canadians are listening. Uh, because a huge community of Ukrainians was supposed to be enemy because Ukraine was uh, cut between uh, Russia and um, 
uh, Austro-Hungary. And these Austro-Hungarians were the enemy of the Canadian. We were in the British Empire, obviously. So they were interned in camps, but they could not do too many camps, so they were in the middle of mountains where it was impossible uh, to, uh, to uh, live. It means, at this point, men were the main targets. Those who were fighting age were seen as potential spies. It was still reserved to uh, the men, to the men. What is going on at the same time for uh, Ukraine? I go back to the best historian, uh, Putin, uh, who uh, speaks about it in a, in a speech of uh, one day before the one uh, before. And there, it's a speech against the humiliating treaty of Brest-Listov, the treaty which ends the war by the Bolsheviks. So he kills two birds with one uh, stone. He, he speaks a little bit with the, about the First World War, and he says that all is the fault of the Bolsheviks, so it will be uh, finished for all the uh, Bolsheviks. Uh, the answer is really uh, interesting. He goes on uh, denying Ukraine, which is a Bolshevik invention, so it should not exist because Bolsheviks are bad. And I, I love the fact that the nationalist Ukrainian did paint with the colors of Ukraine uh, Lenin. Now they do something else. They take out all the Lenin statues. But it's, it's another... Uh, Step. And <clears throat> they say, glory to Ukraine, glory to heroes since 1921. So uh, we'll, it will be enough for the First World War. But in the work of the First World War, there was the invention of a concept, genocide, invented by Raphael Lemkin, that you have here in the uh, U.S. Holocaust Memorial, and uh, we have to see how it links to the First World War. I call, uh, no, I am going to skip because it, it will be uh, too long. So I got, I'll come to uh, Lemkin, and I begin to think about what you, you said about the deportation to Russia of uh, Ukrainian uh, children taken from their parents or taken from uh, orphanages. Uh, and there, it is in the Convention of 48 on genocide. So we are uh, legally in the possibility to say that there is a genocide going on in Ukraine, but it is obviously open to uh, discussion. But before to know if there, there is a genocide now in Ukraine, we have to think that the word was not invented before 1943, and we have to know on what uh, historical uh, basis. Churchill, in August 44, 1941, speaking about the invasion of uh, Russia by the, the Soviet Union, sorry, by the Nazi, said we are in the presence of a crime without a name. And it is Raphael Lemkin who gives that crime uh, a name. Why did he call this crime genocide? He compounded it from the Greek, genus, which means people, but also family or lineage. And with a word in Latin, occidere, killing. And he published it in uh, his work called Axis Rule in Occupied Europe in 44. So he found it somewhere in 43 and published it in uh, 44. This polyglot in new at least 10 languages chose to create what we call a barbarism because he mixes Latin and Greek. And obviously, he does it in purpose, because this, this crime is a crime of uh, barbarity. And I think we have to move to the prehistory of the concept 
and think about the First World War to understand what he was uh, doing at the time. I think we have to go from who knew what in 1942, 43, 44, and who denied what to why was it impossible to uh, believe. Because by 1941, slowly, and in 1942, fully, in both Britain and the United States and the Palestine, the truth was known about the extermination of the Jews, but no one knew that they knew. It is where my experience of the First World War, its false and real atrocities, took all their sense. Contemporary were, in effect, still in the grip of the propaganda lies and exaggeration of the First World War, which was finished only 25 years ago. Some of this false atrocity, the one of the German soldier being uh, cutting uh, babies in pieces uh, or cutting their hand, or German soldier, you, as you see uh, here, uh, torturing people by putting at the end of their uh, horse uh, cart, and they even did not have horse carts at the time. So you see, I took two of them. There is millions of these atrocity pictures, which shows that they were absolutely, uh, absolutely everywhere. And at the same time, there was real atrocities. And this one, everybody thought to have forgotten them, not Lemkin. Lemkin thought that violence against civilians in 1914-1918 had been grossly underestimated. And I believe that one of the reasons for the impossibility of understanding the extermination of the Jews in real time was in part, it was not the only reason, but there was an epistemological blockage which arose during the previous year. They delivered too much with their atrocities. They are not going to tell us again their atrocities now against the Jew. I cannot believe it. When he began his work as a law student at Lviv, just after 1919, Lemkim was particularly unsettled by two war crimes the extermination of the Armenians, and the pogroms in Ukraine. Soon, he thought about these exterminations. And he thought that it was not accidental, but that it was at the heart of a war which was definitely against civilians. During 1914-1918, it had been by far the worst in the Ottoman and Russian empires where population displacement had taken the shape of social, social or ethnic reconstruction. It resulted the extermination of the Armenians and the deportation of the suspect population of Russia, the most suspected being the Jews. And we have the drawing of Abel Pan, which are 40 of them, which shows the situation of the Jews in 1916. And actually, when you discover this open trend, you, you think it, it's crazy. You cannot believe it is 1916, but it is uh, 1916. The young uh, lawyer, Lemkin, was fascinated by two assassinations and two trials, which, for him, encapsulated the two crimes of the Great War. The first one was an Armenian, Sogoman Telerian, who killed the responsible of the extermination of the Armenian, which, as it was said at the time. And the second was Simon Petluyra. I do a little parenthesis here. He is now back as a hero by some Ukrainian nationalists, so we have to know that. 
And he was assassinated because he was a big chief of the pogroms by a Jew, probably an agent of the NKVD, so it's more complicated than, than it looks, in 1926. Lemkin thought about these two crimes, and he thought that these victims who had lost their family could not give justice themselves. You have to have an international, an international law to take care of this kind of crime. He went to work, and in 1933, very early on, he was ready to present a report to the international conference taking place in Madrid called the Unification of Penal Law. And there he put together two notions, the notion of barbarism, destroying a national or religious collectivity, and the notion of vandalism, destruction of works of culture. So you see, everything, or nearly everything, was already there in 1933, but nobody thought that this conceptual innovation should be pursued. Lemke thought the precise opposite. As a Pole and as a Jew who had lived a long time in Ukraine, he was convinced that this type of crime would repeat itself. I can say that the cynical suppression of memories belonged, obviously, to totalitarianism, but democracies knew about it and let it go. If you look at this um, unbelievable cartoons about the genocide of the Armenian, called at the time extermination or annihilation, uh, you see that people could laugh about the extermination of an entire, an entire people. And when the war was over, they didn't care at all. It was important during the time because they said the Germans did the thing. But when it was the Turks, nobody, uh, nobody cared. Uh, it's interesting to know that because you have also here what I would call a mirror effect. The Turks were the first to say that the Armenians were the perpetrators and they were the victims in a kind of mirror effect. When we hear Putin saying that he wants to denazify Ukraine and protect the Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine against the genocide, I'm not invented, he does exactly what the Turks did during the First World War and after, and he does exactly the same thing that the Nazi did during the Second uh, World War. And it's really terrifying to see that all the time, every time, the perpetrators think they are victims. And it is true till uh, today. Lemkin was prevented to see the concept of genocide or genocide he just invented used an, an incrimination in the Nuremberg trial. Nevertheless, an Armenian survivor called Shavarsh Misakian, you have it, his paper here, understood that it was important for him. And as early as December 9, 1945, it took the word genocide for what happened to the uh, Armenians between 1915 and 1918. Misakian had very well understood genocide why was really the death of a people in itself, not simply what we could call collateral damage due to the war, especially by destroying the families and the children with no more hope of reproduction, of going on with families, culture, or religion, as you can see here about this these uh, women and, and kids in Alep, this total uh, destruction. As said, the Ukrainian Nobel Prize 
Alexandra Mavichuk receiving her prize this fall, we should not be stuck on Nuremberg and go forward. We live in a new century. Justice cannot wait. And also, war transforms people in figures. We have to know the names of all the victims. Lemkin had conceptualized four types of techniques of genocide, physical genocide, immediate murder, biological genocide, which suppresses the right to exist in the future by killing women, babies, and so on. And finally, cultural genocide, which was very important for him, but with the idea of eradication of culture and civilization, which is central today if you think about Ukraine language, Ukraine literature. But at the time, in 1948, they did not want to hear about it. They were absolutely against it. To conclude how all this goes into Ukraine, I leave, obviously, the bulk of the Holocaust to Omar, who is a great specialist of Ukraine genocide. I just want you uh, to see a little bit of one of, I think, the most atrocious, as much beautiful text about the Holocaust, Vasily Grossman, Ukraine Without Jews, which he wrote in 1943, was obviously rejected by publication, and we know only since the 1990s. It is four pages of the disparition of an entire people. In Ukraine, there is no Jews nowhere. And then he goes about all the possibilities you had to be an Ukrainian Jew, which is everything in life, and all this has disappeared. Obviously, with this definitive and, and um, amazing uh, text, doesn't care, take care of all the problem of the Holocaust in Ukraine. And the Ukrainian nationalist, by hate of the Soviet, did collaborate very much to the killing of the uh, two of the uh, Ukrainian Jews. This doesn't make of Ukraine a nation of Nazis today. Even if Bandera, perhaps, and we can discuss that later, as to my taste, perhaps gained too much of a national figure because after being an anti-Semite and a killer, he was himself assassinated by the uh, Soviets. All this comes from the biggest lie of Stalin, followed and enlarged by uh, Putin, the total denial of what the Ukrainian call today the Holodomor, the murder by hunger. Lemkin again, he has called the genocide, the repression and killing by hunger of certainly four million Ukrainians in a seminal text of 1953 called Soviet Genocide in uh, Ukraine. What I want to speak about is perhaps the classic example of Soviet genocide. I don't know if there is a non-classic example of Soviet genocide, but we can discuss about it. Lemkin obviously had seen correctly the famine sponsored by Stalin, the Holodomor, was a genocide, no, but no doubt about it. Prominent historians are unanimous on this fact today, even though the debate over the legal qualification of the crime of genocide uh, continues. But I will plagiarize Hitler he, here a little bit around Stalin. Hitler was saying the Jewish people has to disappear from the earth. Stalin said something like the Ukrainian people has to disappear from the earth. That's why the Ukrainian parliament voted to recognize the Holodomor 
as a deliberate act of genocide in 2006, and you have here President Zelensky and his wife in front of this um, memorial. Obviously, the Ukrainians are very grateful to uh, Lemkin. They are now, they have not been for a long time. They were not when they were uh, Soviets, still Soviets, obviously. Lemkin was not known, as was not known the extermination of the Jews. Uh, now, is everywhere. You have it on the left on his own university. You have it on the, on the right, actually, in uh, the Ukraine Institute in uh, uh, New York. And obviously, Lemkin has become a great hero in uh, Ukraine, but it came very, very late. I conclude. Distort and sometimes denial history has been the aim of war for the Russians. Going back to the stars, to the Tsar, because of their huge Russian empire, and to Stalin without communism, but with a great patriotic war, which was won and has to go on against the two-day Nazi, the Ukrainian, and the Russian dissidents about the past, particularly the one who fight against the dis disparition of the uh, memory of the Gulag. It's not by accident that the association memorial was dissolved one month before the special operation in Ukraine. And these days, just when I speak to you, it is the trial, trial of Oleg Orlov, one of the founders of a memorial. That's why the Ukrainian fight for that nation right in their borders as a state. They were in 1921 a republic inside Soviet Union, in 1991 an independent republic. And the fight also to stop the lies about the past and the present. I uh, particularly like very much cartoons because I think they are a the great way to see history and to see history in its time without anachronism. And all these uh, cartoons of uh, Hitler and uh, Stalin posing with uh, Putin are uh, absolutely uh, interesting if they are not at all uh, funny, obviously. The idea also is to bring the aggressor to justice. And uh, there is, in particular, this very interesting site about uh, Kharkiv, where they take you around Kharkiv and they uh, show you the evidence of crimes, which can be crimes against humanity or perhaps crimes of genocide. But the fake news are all over, and uh, I know that the French Foreign Service was uh, impacted by false uh, news from the Russians. And uh, here it's an uh, Israeli magazine that I found, which is an Israeli magazine, a fake one, faked by the Russian. And you have the Israeli, uh, which is bearing the heavy uh, swastika, which is a Ukrainian one. And uh, I've heard that it was so well done that uh, for a certain time, people thought it was, uh, it was a real Israeli magazine and not a Russian uh, fake, uh, fake news. So... There is plenty of cartoons, but I will stop uh, there and finish with uh, President uh, Zelensky on May 8, 2023, going back to the Second World War and explaining that if the Ukrainian do celebrate now the end of the, great, of the Second World War, on May 8th, it's because they belong 
to the democratic state who together fighted the Nazi and finished on May 8th. Um, Ukraine doesn't belong to Soviet Union than Russia, who thought they had won the war alone and were doing it in May uh, 9th. And he finishes, obviously, by the victory of Ukraine and the free world, liberation of our lands, the return of our people, protecting our values, justice against the Russist ideology of hatred. But this idea of ideology of hatred, Russist means racist and Russian, but the Russian call Ukrainian also Ukrofascisti. Uh, sorry for my Russian. And uh, this is not a great sign for future. We have the present and we have the future. And in the future, an independent Ukraine, a free Ukraine, will have a long border with Russia. This will never uh, stop. I quote again the Nobel Prize, Alexandra Machvichuk. You don't have to be Ukrainians to support Ukraine. You just have to be human beings. But what about the future? Raymond Aron did not stop thinking on these trends about 1918, 1945, the Cold War. I quote him, to kill the monster without letting him find in spilled blood and defeat a new strength. Can you find strength in defeat? It will be terrible for tomorrow. But I am afraid sometime Aaron was right. And I can offer an answer with my favorite, again, Mark Bloch. You have it here. These badly extinguished ashes burn hands. They don't burn only hands. And the last two, Walter Benjamin, the only writer of history with the gift of setting alight the sparks of hope in the past, is the one who is convinced of this, that not even the dead will be safe from the enemy if he is victorious. And this enemy has not ceased to be victorious. I had prepared this lecture when the dead from a previous cemetery came back from the bottom of the Krakowa Dam to inhabit the present war. And also, the bombs are not falling very far from Babi Yar, the huge place where the Jews were exterminated during the Second World War near Kiev. And on the other shore of the Dnieper, there is the forest of Bikovnia. And in this forest, at least 7,000 people were killed by the NKVD in the 30s. Where are all these dead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen Becker, for your remarks today. I am delighted to be moderating the second part um, of this event, and we'll be engaging on the more salient points of your lecture um, and turn to Professor Barter for his remarks. We will finally go uh, to, the, to, the, to the audience for a Q&A um, session, and I think we'll be expanding, I guess, the scope of the discussion a little bit. Uh, Professor Bartov, I'm turning to you now. I'm guessing you have a few remarks, and I know that Professor Becker also wanted you to touch upon the Salient points on World War II in particular. I was going to say World War III. I guess that's a Freudian slip. Uh, World War II, sorry. Um, so the floor is yours now. 
we're looking forward to uh, it. Thank you, and thank you for hosting this event. Thank you, Annette, uh, for this wonderful lecture. Um, um, and to the Brookings Institute, of course. Um, I, 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 I was asked to speak for about 10 minutes or so. I probably uh, could speak for another couple of hours, but so I'll just um, um, speak in some bullet points. I mean, the first thing I want to say is that um, for people like me, and I think Annette, um, when the war in Russia began, or the Russian invasion of Ukraine began, uh, many of us felt that history had come back uh, in a very strange and disturbing way. We've been teaching World War I, World War II, and suddenly I, I remember standing in front of a class and showing them a map of southern Ukraine that I had prepared for something that had to do with World War II and the Holocaust, and I said to them a year ago, you would not have recognized any of these names of towns and cities, and now you know them from CNN or wherever you are getting your news. Uh, so, so it is um, a kind of shocking moment. And of course, we live in an era where this is not the only return. Um, it's, the war has returned, devastating war has returned, and it has returned uh, to areas that had been destroyed um, in World War I and in World War II, it's part of even a larger uh, return of the repressed, if you like, um, in terms of the kind of political extremism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, racism, populism that has come to inhabit uh, so many political entities uh, in the last few years. So there may be one connection here that I'd like to draw which is between that war and its context. In some ways, the return of nationalism. Uh, 20 years ago, um, I, I remember the general convention, certainly among historians and other intellectuals, was that um, nationalism is gone. It's, uh, it's passé. We now live in a multicultural world. We now, Europe is now one continent, and uh, Germans and French don't really know the difference. Uh, who are they? They can live in one place or another. And suddenly, uh, nationalism is back, too. So various things are coming back, and I think that's something that we want to talk about a little bit more. I want to say also that for me, and I've written, as some of you may know, Annette knows, I've written very critically about uh, Ukrainian politics of memory. Um, and what, when that war began, I did and I continue to do whatever I can to uh, encourage people to support Ukraine in its war uh, in its defensive war against an aggressive and illegal invasion by Russia. Uh, whatever that past is, and whatever parts of it have remained unworked, and there are significant chunks of it, uh, um, helping Ukraine defend itself is crucial, not only for moral, ethical, legal reasons, but also because the alternative would be a complete dismantling of the international order. Um, and the outcome of that is largely impossible to, to predict. Um, uh, and so it is incumbent uh, on all of us, I think, to support Ukraine and to do whatever we can and whatever our governments can do uh, in support of Ukraine. Um, I want to say a few things about other contexts. Uh, so one is, um, in terms of historical narratives, and Annette spoke about how Putin has been propagating a particular historical narrative. Now, that historical narrative, of course, is not Putin's invention. Uh, he is borrowing um, from a much larger um, Russian discourse about Ukraine. Uh, that is not even Soviet, but goes back to the 19th century. 
Um, and without getting into a great deal of detail, uh, it is that Ukraine is part of Russia, and in, san- in a sense that Russia cannot be Russia without Ukraine, because Russia can only be Russia as an empire that includes Ukraine as uh, perhaps its most important uh, non-ethnic Russian component. Um, and, and in that sense, uh, Putin is not, as often happens with propaganda, when he speaks to Russians, uh, many Russians understand exactly what he's talking about. He's not saying something that is new to them when he speaks of Russia as being, um, of, of Ukraine as being little Russia. Uh, many Russians, even Russians who may not at all like his regime, uh, understand that kind of language. Um, the, the alternative historical narrative is the Ukrainian historical narrative, which is a very complex one. And again, we don't have time right now to go into all the details of that. But the creation of Ukraine is really Ukraine as being the country of the middle, the country, the borderland country, Ukraine. And that borderland country is between Poland and Russia. Now, Poland now we think of as not a very large country in Eastern Europe, but it used to be a very large country that was Eastern Europe. All of Eastern Europe was the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and much of it was Ukraine. Uh, And Ukrainian uh, nationalism, as it evolves, uh, is one which has to do with separating Ukraine from these two great entities, the, Rus- the growing Russian Empire on the east um, in, the, in, in the 17th, 18th century, and the diminishing but still powerful Polish Empire west of Ukraine. And it has to do not only with politics, but also with the fact that um, the peoples are mixed. That is, that, in, that west Ukraine in large part is Polonized, and east Ukraine in large part is Russian. Uh, and how do you tear yourself uh, uh, out of, of this mix? How do you create a, an, an independent Ukraine that is neither one nor the other? And the third narrative uh, is a Jewish narrative of Ukraine. And that Jewish narrative of Ukraine is important not only because large numbers of Jews lived in Ukraine, but because the conversation about um, atrocities, history, genocide uh, include very much the faith of Jews uh, in Ukraine. And that too has a long historical narrative that begins in very two, different, two very different perceptions of the early history of Ukraine. Uh, that is of the 17th century, of the beginning, as it is seen in retrospect from the 19th century, the beginning of Ukrainian nationalism with the great uprising of the Cossacks. Uh, led by Bohdan Khmelnytsky. So Khmelnytsky is seen in Ukraine as the first national hero, and in Jewish um, lore, in Jewish memory, he is the massacre of Jews. Uh, He is the scourge of the Jews because that uprising included um, 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 basically the destruction of Jewish communities uh, in the areas at least east of the Dnieper. Um, and so these three historical narratives are important to understand when, when we try to look at the deeper roots of what we are seeing right now and how they're being interpreted in various places. You may know that uh, I come from Israel, and I go there a lot, and I um, follow the media there, and uh, many Israelis, ill-informed Israelis, as most people these days are, um, uh, think of uh, Ukrainians as being generally anti-Semites. Uh, Ukrainians hate Jews, uh, and therefore, why should we support them? We should support the Russians. The Russians won the Great Patriotic War, which put an end to the Holocaust. So uh, this, this plays into a variety of of understanding. So this is one context I wanted just to talk about without delving too deeply into it, these these different historical narratives. The second, very briefly, I'd say, you know, we're we're celebrating, or not celebrating exactly, commemorating uh, 100 years to uh, Lausanne, to the international agreement uh, in Lausanne, which was um, about the... um, 
which, which ties into the story of the Armenian genocide. But in this case, uh, in 1923, there's a decision to um, uh, exchange populations between what becomes by then uh, independent Turkey, the Turkish state, and Greece, and about a million and a half people uh, moved from one place to another. Uh, Greeks uh, returned to Greece, where they had never lived for about two millennia, uh, and Turks, or really Muslims, are moved as Turks from uh, Greece to uh, Turkey, and that is seen subsequently uh, by a variety of international bodies, including the Peel Commission uh, which is concerned with the partition of Palestine as a good example of how you can resolve these problems of mixed peoples. How do we unmixed, unmix people by forcibly removing them, by putting one in one nation state and another group in another nation state, which involves, of course, a huge amount of suffering, loss of property, loss of status, loss of memory, loss of culture, and in many ways can connect to the very notion of genocide, only it is internationally agreed upon and forced on populations. It, legalized, legalized yes, ethnic claims. Exactly. And so I, th- I think when we, when we think of, of that context, it, the larger context of that is population displacement. And population displacement is one major feature of the 20th century. And what we see now in the 21st century is, again, this attempt to either change the identity of groups that you want to um, take over or displace them. Uh, We have to remember that one thing that has happened in this war in Ukraine is that the population of Ukraine has has, um, um, uh, dropped significantly. Uh, There were about 40 million um, people living in Ukraine when the war began, and some estimates put the population now between 30 and 20. So millions of people, and many of them, of course, children, not only those who were uh, kidnapped by the Russians, but larger numbers that have escaped to the West from the war. Uh, That is, in a sense, a forced displacement of population. So I think it's very important to remember this, and I'll say one last thing, otherwise I'll be going on too long. And and that has to do with um, Ukrainian history itself. As I said, um, um, I was obviously uh, involved for many years in uh, studying uh, the case of West Ukraine, which used to be East Galicia. Uh, and in between was the, the, um, um, the eastern part of uh, resurrected Poland in the interwar period. And what is now is West Ukraine. And that uh, era, part of Ukraine, uh, which had not been uh, under Ukrainian rule and had not been under Soviet rule until World War II, um, had a, a, a mix of populations. Um, uh, it had a majority Ukrainian or Ruthenian population. This is about 20% of the population of Ukraine that I'm talking about, the, these Western provinces. So the majority were Ukrainians who were often called Ruthenians at the time uh, for interesting reasons. Um, the the uh, second largest group were Poles, and the third uh, largest group were Jews. Uh, Jews were about 10% of the population. By the end of World War II, that area is, is, um, uh, is ethnically homogeneous. Uh, it basically has only Ukrainians in it. Um, that was the goal of uh, Ukrainian nationalism, which was created there and which in its uh, more radical form as it develops because of not least very oppressive Polish rule uh, in the interwar period wants to create a Pole-free and Jew-free Ukraine. Uh, And that is uh, the core of the violence that occurs in that area in part in cooperation with German policies and in part completely independently of these policies. That is, that, you, that uh, Ukrainian nationalists uh, participate and assist in the genocide of the Jews in that area. Um, they're engaged um, um, appro- approximately with the murder of about 800,000 Jews, 
uh, in those areas, in, in, um, in what is now parts of Belarus and parts of West Ukraine. Um, and after that is over, by 1943, June, summer 1943, the same bodies of Ukrainian nationalists, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, and later the Ukrainian um, the, the UPA, the, the, um, the, the military arm of the, uh, uh, Ukrainian orga- the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, engage in ethnically cleansing the Polish population of that area, which is now considered officially by the Polish government, by law, as genocide. Uh, and so what, what you have is a moment of extreme violence, part of which is by a, a, a state that comes from the outside with particular targets. In this case, the Nazis come in, and the Germans come in, and they want to kill the Jews, and local national interests, which in that case are predominantly Ukrainian nationalists. Um, now, this history disappears after World War II uh, because the Soviets come in, they take over this area, and they suppress this whole history. They say, yes, most Ukrainians fought bravely, which is, by the way, true, that vast uh, majority of Ukrainians uh, served in the Red Army, not in these um, uh, nationalist units. Uh, And there were some bad apples, some fascists who collaborated, uh, but we won't talk about them. We we already took care of them. And one cannot talk about these... uh, uh, nationalist organizations until 1991. In 1991, Ukraine becomes independent, and as it becomes independent, those individuals, including, of course, Stepan Bandera, who was mentioned here, who was the head of the more radical faction of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, reappear in public memory, and they shift uh, from West Ukraine also to Central Ukraine. That is, they, they, they get to be also adopted by uh, Kiev in part. Uh, and what is remembered about them is that they were freedom fighters. They were among the people who from Khmelnytsky um, 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 through World War I, uh, through Petyura to uh, Bandera fought for Ukrainian independence. And what is forgotten and, and, and suppressed is the fact that those organizations were also involved in, in genocide and in ethnic cleansing. My own, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop here, my, my own sense, and I've said that also to Ukrainian audiences, and some don't love me saying it, uh, and I know some other people have uh, spoken similarly, my own sense is, as I said, you, Ukraine must be defended now for all the good reasons. Uh, But had Ukraine done better uh, in the years before the war to face up to its own dark past, and that's a very hard thing to do. For uh, Poland has had a hard time with it. Germany had a hard time with it. France had a very hard time with it. My country of Israel not only has a hard time with it, but doesn't do it at all. And you can see the the results right now. Uh, But had Ukraine been able to do it, it would have given less ammunition to the kind of uh, lying propaganda coming out of the Kremlin now about denazification of Ukraine, whose president, as we all know, uh, is not only Jewish, but most of whose Jewish uh, family was murdered in the Holocaust. Um, and maybe there's a lesson in that too, that uh, w- we should all also uh, try to look back at the darker episodes of our history instead of trying to suppress them so that we don't become victims of those um, ghosts of the past once again. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I'm mindful of the time, so I'll ask you one question and then we'll open uh, to the audience. Um, Coming back to the idea of total war that you mentioned, um, in many ways the war in Ukraine totally confounded our assumptions of what war in the 21st century would be like. We thought it would be more technologically driven, less human casualties, no state-to-state conflict anymore. And this war has proven us wrong in many ways. Can you explain maybe why this lack of study of history or is there any other reason why we couldn't anticipate that actually this would be a 
a conflict as we had seen in actually in the previous years, in the previous centuries as well. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think it comes, and I will with, join what was uh, uh, Omer saying about the, the, the Holocaust, the past, uh, these heroes of the, of the past, which are heroes on the nationalist side, but are killers in the same time. And, uh, and this is denied. Uh, this is denied because you have to go forward. And the same about the conventional war. You have to go forward. So you think about uh, the, the, the bombing and the missiles, and you forget about the fact that on the ground, there is no other way than to fight man to man or tank to, or tank, to, to tank. And it's exactly what is happening now. But we have the two, because look at the importance of the drones. The drones are the new technology, and if I'm not mistaken, the Israeli were the first to use them in, in, in really huge fashion. Then it was taken all over, and it's very interesting that the Russians for that were late, and they used the Iranian technology, who are very good at that. So we have the two. And uh, I, I think we, we have to think about the, the denial of history, not only for ideology, but also for technology. Because uh, when you, you have the military who are taking care of, of uh, the, the battlefield and the armies, uh, they have a lot of lessons of history. It's not that it is not taught. But uh, they have like their own agenda, uh, and the agenda of history is very strict. You have to to think that on a battlefield, when you get to the cities, it is city uh, city uh, siege, and the siege is always done the same the same way, and uh, you can go by 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 the top. Uh, the only technology we would ch which will change everything, and uh, the Russians have been menacing all the time, will be the nuclear menace. But all the rest has to go back to conventional because the technology has to be conventional on the ground. You cannot do anything else. You know, I mean... Um I'd, I'd say, in one, j just to add to this from, from a slightly different angle, um, th 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 there's been a lot about uh, the use of social media, of fake news, of electronics. of, um, And I was thinking that, that in some ways, um, just like in the case of actual warfare, um, you, you can make very clear analogies uh, to past wars. You can actually, in terms of the Russian uh, manner of fighting, you can go all the way back to the Seven Year War. Uh, there was a great battle between the Prussian army, which was the best army in the world then, and the Russian army, and nobody won. They, they just slaughtered each other um, because the Russians kept sending more and more people in. And it created the kind of image of Russia fighting wars that way, and it did so. It did so in World War I, to the detriment of, of the Tsar, of course, uh, because it did eventually lead to a revolution, and it, and, and it did so in World War II, and by all appearances, this is what's happening now. Um, but also in terms of propaganda, I actually find that uh, not much has been invented. Annette was showing some of these um, cartoons, and in some ways, the means have changed somewhat, obviously, uh, but the, the, the attempt to manipulate uh, opinion uh, is very similar, and it has to do with mass society, so it would have been very different in the Middle Ages, of course, because you're talking to different publics, but once you have this public from the 19th century on, I don't think it changes that much, and I agree that when you come down to, say, urban warfare, um, unless you, you blow up the whole city with the nuclear bomb, 
um, you destroy it. And that the Russians are very good at just having a lot of artillery, um, doing it on and on and on until finally there's no city to defend anymore. And they did it in several cases now. I just want to add one last thing. And it, it's, it, it's sort of, um, Annette was talking about um, victims. And I think that's a really important element here to, to emphasize that um, in this kind of 20th century total war, genocide, ethnic cleansing, population displacement, this whole context, one fascinating aspect of it is that the people who victimize others see themselves often as their victims' victims. And it's not completely wrong there's always a kernel of truth in that. And that has to be understood. It's, so when, when the Turks or, or the Ottoman authorities decide that, okay, they have to eliminate the Armenians, they say, well, the, there's Armenian nationalism within, um, within Anatolia. The Armenians are a threat to us because they're close to Russia and some of them are fighting with the Russians. Uh, our empire is falling apart and therefore we have to kick them out. Um, the Germans, obviously, as Annette was saying, say that about the Jews. The Jews are the real internal enemy. We lost World War I because of the, of, the, of the Reds and the Jews, because of the socialists and the Jews. They stabbed us in the back. Uh, and the Russians have, I think, have had a long-standing complaint, uh, which is not vacuous. It's not about Ukraine, but it's about the fact that uh, the Soviet Union sacrificed more uh, soldiers and civilians in World War II than uh, anyone else times a lot. Uh, without the Red Army, uh, World War II would not have ended the way it did. Uh, it's, it, there's one interesting statistic that even in uh, June of 1944, after the Allied landing in Normandy, the Wehrmacht is losing 10 times as many men on the Eastern Front than on the Western Front. Even as the Allies have just landed, you know, the Americans, the Canadians, the Brits are all there, the Russians are causing 10 times as many losses to the Wehrmacht. And that, I think, is, is something that has remained for Russians a sense that their, their own uh, contribution, their own victimhood has never been recognized. Um, and it's part of how they perceive this world, the West, to this day, I think. Thank you. Um, I just add something. I totally agree with all of that, but uh, there is also the, li the line behind, because in 1939, uh, they agreed with the German Nazi yeah. to take over... Yeah. Big chunk of in, fact, in fact, the agreement between Hitler and Stalin yeah. is what triggered World War II. Exactly. Yes. It yes. is what triggered World War yes. II, and it's also which made the fact that they were not ready to yeah. fight, uh, to fight yes. the Nazis, and they lost so much, and they oh. nearly lost the war in 41, right. and uh, the incredible number uh, of of, of, of dead, which is atrocious, and it is true that it is not recognized enough by the West till now. Oh. This I totally agree. But in the same time, it is the yeah. fault of Stalin. Uh, so uh, there is always a lie in, inside yeah. the truth, and the truth inside the lies. That's why it's so complicated yeah. on every side. And uh, the, now, what you were saying about the, the cities is so true that when the Ukrainian or the Russian who fight with the Ukrainian, it's not very clear, invaded a little part of the western part of Russia, immediately the people in this area stopped saying special operation and spoke about war because it was on their territory. So I, I just read it by accident, and I thought it was really interesting to see... Uh, what is a war or, or, or not, and mm. how you, do you feel it? But I began to say that the myths were very active, and yeah. we have to think that there are myths everywhere all the time, and that's why we are historians. I am working for my profession, for our profession. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll take one round of questions, 
if you can briefly introduce yourselves and have a very brief and clear question, uh, the young lady here, please. We take, I think, the three that I saw just now. Hey, uh, thank you so much for the lecture. My name is Anna, and I'm Ukrainian. I'm from Kyiv. I'm studying in University of Wyoming right now, and this summer intern with New Lines Institute here in DC. But I'm from Kyiv. I live in Kyiv. My family is still in Kyiv. Uh, thank you for this lecture and discussion. Um, I personally want to thank you, Annette, for all the remarks you made about um, ecocide and previous century genocides. Um, I want to start, my question is, is going to be about historical nar narrations and their role um, in, in this war and the role of Ukrainian agency, to be specific, the lack of Ukrainian agency in Europe and the U.S. in telling this history. So, Sorry, one yeah, question. very Just short one question. question. So more. most of the Western world has been learning about Ukraine from Russian textbooks, from Russian experts, from Russian immigration, and not from Ukrainians. And it resulted it... It resulted in the vision that Red Army was Russian Army, and it was not. Red Army was the army of Ukrainians, Belarusians, Russians. And if we take a look at the loss of every nation, Ukrainians are going the first. Moreover, the battlefield was in Ukraine, and Ukrainians were never given the credit for that. Instead, Russia took the role of the winner, the role of the you know, rescuer of the Europe, and ended up right now saying Mojem Pofterit, which means we can repeat this war once again. Ukrainians who were never given a chance to tell their own history, to speak up for their history here in the Western world, are now also in the battle of proving that World War II also was our war where we were killed and we were, you know, fighting. Do you have in your mind any mechanism how Ukrainian agency and voice could be empowered right now to shift it and to give more attention to Ukrainian historians and people? Thank you. Thank you. And I think there was a question on the other side in the back. Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, thank you so much for the lecture. My name is Jack Galloway. Um, I just had a question about reconciliation in like a post-Putin Russia. Would a future leader of Russia, um, would that be necessary for a centralized control of the Russian state to be able to understand Putin's flaws in the, you know, the Ukrainian invasion in a post-Putin uh, Russia? Thank you. You have two minutes to answer these two questions. Uh, do you want to start over and we will finish with Anna? Sure, quickly. Um, on, the, on the Ukrainian narrative, I think now... There are a number. I, I'm, I just thought off the top of my head uh, two uh, American. One is uh, Ukrainian, but is a professor at Harvard. Two very prominent voices, uh, Timothy Snyder and uh, Andriy Plochy, who have been writing and speaking a great deal uh, about providing the Ukrainian um, uh, narrative, I think quite effectively. Um, it's, it's recent, it's, but it started before the war. Uh, and I, th I think, you know, we can't say that there is no, there are no voices in the West now uh, speaking uh, also f or telling the Ukrainian narrative on uh, reconciliation. I don't know. I, I, th I think that everybody is thinking about what's going to happen after the end of the war. I just thought of something that I heard a former... Uh, Russian foreign minister say about what what would the end of uh, Putin be like? So he said that in Russia you don't just come to the head of state and say you know you you may have made a mistake maybe you're wrong. You either uh, if you come you come with a gun and you say uh, either you are going to retire or we are taking you to the nearby cemetery. Uh, and so in that sense, it's impossible to tell, it seems to me, uh, where this would go in Russia. In Ukraine, one hopes very much that this war will end soon and that uh, Ukraine will have the energy left and the support to rebuild itself as what it was becoming, which was a true 
um, democratic uh, civil society, uh, which is probably one reason, a major reason, why Russia or Putin could not take it uh, right on its border. Uh, that threat to show the, the alternative of a, a society that had been under Soviet rule, had been under Russian imperial rule, and chose an alternative uh, that is democratic and liberal. To answer very quickly to the first question, uh, I remember that Kiev was a hero city in '65. And so under the Soviet rule, uh, it was not true that the uh, effort of the Ukrainian in the, in the Great Patriotic War was not recognized. Uh, it was severely cut after the independence of, of, uh, of Ukraine uh, from the Russian history. It, it's part of the new uh, narration of the, of the Russian uh, but it is to the Ukrainian to work on it. And as uh, uh, Omer was saying about uh, the heroes who are also killers, you have to, to, to do your own story. And this had begun. Uh, you were looking at my, at my book on genocides, and the first edition in French was extremely critical of the Ukrainian. Uh, about uh, the not recognizing enough the Holocaust and putting the holo Holodomor too much. And the second edition, the English one, have been cutting this much more in favor of the Ukrainians because the Ukrainian historians have been working extremely hard in the last 20 years to have a new history, a real history based on archives to show the truth doesn't exist, but something which is nearer the reality of the history of the, of the 19th and 20th uh, century. And uh, it is going really in the right direction. <coughs> About the post-war, I have no idea. And I cannot read in the future. But I'm afraid of something, is that... Like in the First World War, the Ukrainian people is extremely consentant to the war. They are doing it really by patriotic fervor and by democratic fervor. And it is something which is new in a world of post-war where everybody is for peace. They are not for peace because they are for the nation and they fight for it. In the same time, the news from Russia are spare, and a lot of people left Russia because they didn't want to do this war, some for political reasons, some for personal reasons because they didn't want to fight the wrong war. But it's very few compared to the Russian population. It is an enslaved population by a lot of, of ways, but you can leave the country and most people stay. And most people go and fight because they are very poor and they are paid to do this war. So how you reconcile after and make peace, I am very pessimistic. Thank you. We will end on this then. Thank you so much for the audience and thank you so much to Annette Becker and Omar thank Barksoff you to for you. joining, joining <laughs> us today. Please give them a big round of applause. Thank you.